This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. So I had what many refer to as the standard American teenage film education, which is to say I would peruse the IMDb Top 250, see a film that intrigued me, and watch it thinking this list formed the entirety of essential film canon. This coalesced with a series of other influences. Oscar nominees, aesthetic film vines, top 10 channels like Cinefix or WatchMojo, the former of whom I think had a little more integrity. This is, of course, a tiny box, itself a quintessential canon, not of cinema itself, but of the long-parodied, narrow-minded, dare I say film bro palette, but it gave me a foundation when I had no other guidance or mentorship. I mean, I went to film camps and took a film class in high school, but they would more or less teach within that prescribed American teenage film box. I'd watch, like, the Mark Cousins docuseries and Microdose World Cinema, but the furthest I really sank my teeth into, beyond popular one-off films, I mean, really getting a sense of a movement, was the French New Wave perhaps the least adventurous of all non-American cinema, or at least the most in line with the curriculum I'm describing. I was still very much in that box when I started this channel, and I haven't even ventured that far out of it at this point. Honestly, a lot of what I was taught in film school sticks within these parameters, and it was more the people I met there that pushed me to expand my horizons. I'm still in a pretty narrow box, though. I have a long, long way to go. But I was looking at a list of my favorite movies recently and got a little embarrassed by how much of the list was comprised of my 14-year-old taste, which is still being presented to the world as the extent of my current taste. Part of this has to do with the fact that the more movies I've watched and the more I've branched out, the dodgier I've become on the subject of a favorite movie, because what's out there is so varied it's impossible to really compare. Any favorites you see on Letterboxd, for instance, are completely arbitrary. But it got me thinking about that Tarantino interview where he talks about outgrowing Godard. It's a little ironic because Tarantino is a filmmaker many people grow out of, considering his baby's first sense of authorship from a filmmaker reputation, at least in the sphere I'm talking about. But also, the notion of a filmmaker having such a stronghold on you for such a long period of time and having such direct influence I found the notion of outgrowing that a little sad. I more or less subscribe to the belief that the staple film bro movies got the reputation that they have because they are in fact good movies and hold up against things outside of that box, and that the problem has more to do with not venturing any further out of it. But I do wonder what I'd think now of the movies that had such a stronghold on me back in the day that I honestly just haven't seen in a while. I managed to narrow it down to five, and the first one is... <laughs> This was one of my first favorite movies, after like, Super 8 and Lemonade Mouth, which, spoiler, I will not be evaluating in this video. It makes sense. Scott Pilgrim obviously appeals to a young sensibility, in part because it's critiquing the character's immaturity, but also reveling in it quite a bit. The film underperformed when it came out, but it was the wave of video essays championing it as an underappreciated masterpiece that kind of ballooned its reputation a bit and makes it hard to defend because it's not exactly a cultural underdog anymore. For years, my take was basically that it really was that good, but I didn't want to be associated with the crowd that was vocal about it, so I was glad to get a little more clarity on it this time around. The craft is undeniable, and in my opinion, the most impressive aspect is how it functions as an adaptation. After I watched the movie in fifth grade, I read the comics all the way through like five times, lent the box set to my friends, made everyone I knew read it, I was pretty obsessed. My rereads continued into middle school, and I think what I appreciated more than the zany video game references or dumb action was that under the sort of epic bacon aesthetic it had going for it, it was a pretty grounded, almost slice-of-life drama about a bunch of early 20-somethings burning out together, stagnating or even regressing in a time when their adult lives should be flourishing and then occasionally Scott has to fight someone. The movie embraces its inherently short runtime and cuts down on this slice of life aspect while using a maximalist framework to retain as many details from the series as possible, taking full plot lines from the source material and condensing them into details and one-off remarks that are as weightless as the easter eggs and micro-level bits the film is teeming with anyway. But they color in a world that's surprisingly dense for how fast and breezily it's presented. Similar thing with how it maintains its scope of characters. The movie uses the same info boxes as the comics to introduce people, but in a comic, you read the info box and then you read the dialogue, so the box is really no more efficient than just introducing them through exposition in the scene. The movie 
movie lets us focus on two things at once, showing us the info box so we get the essential information on the character, but in terms of runtime, they only hang around long enough to deliver whatever bit they were introduced for in the first place and then dip out of the movie, fleshing out the sprawling web of interconnected people who all know Scott and each other. All this is to say that the movie achieves a world that's just as rich and lived in as the comics, we just don't get as much time to live in it. And for the most part, that's an impressive feat, but I do think it takes a bit of a toll toward the end of the second act. When Scott and Ramona are evaluating their relationship and they're like, Guess we really don't know that much about each other, do we? It's like, yeah, you've only been dating for a couple weeks. That makes sense. I think it's a little indicative of what the film chooses to prioritize. Decisions that were also made in the adaptation process and the mindset of what works best for the medium but still occasionally cost the movie some emotional nutrients. For instance, I think it was probably a smart decision to give Sex bob some actually good music because it makes the sensory experience of the film more palatable and quite literally musical, something you can throw on whenever and vibe to. But what we lose here is the burnout wistfulness of these guys devoting their lives to a hopelessly shitty band. I think one of the most impactful moments in the comics is in the last issue, either after the final showdown during a stretch of epilogue or toward the the end where everything's going wrong, but Scott's hanging out with Steven Stills, and Steven's like, so, wanna talk about the band? In that one panel, I felt sort of embodies the whole going in circles, not developing or maturing, stuck in a rut lifestyle that the story was written to reckon with in the first place. And with Sex bob actually having some decent songs and getting a record deal, I don't get that sense anymore. But the movie taps into it in other departments, albeit to a lesser degree, and it more or less works there. Where this doesn't work so much is back to the expedited relationship drama. The kinks that Scott and Ramona are working out in their relationship are things that would either indicate that they're not really compatible in the first place in such an early stage of dating, or would just come up way later in the relationship. But because the film needs to track an arc that originally takes place over the course of a year, these beats feel a little forced. And worse is when Scott has to confront cheating on Knives and Ramona, the other big discoursey element of the movie. I always used to argue that the film is critiquing Scott, so it's not problematic. And while it is critiquing him and making it an arc for him to atone, he apologizes and is more or less immediately forgiven, which doesn't feel particularly earned. I hate to keep comparing it to the source material, but in the comics, Knives and Ramona are given much more time to sit with the knowledge and watch that affect their relationships with Scott, eventually coming to a much more mature catharsis about it. And I think that difference has something to do with why so many people think Scott should end up with Knives in the end. The whole Ramona Knives reversal is demonstrated by the Pac-Man thing, where Scott lands the joke with ease for Knives and chokes with Ramona. I guess there's a case to be made that this shows that Scott's more comfortable to be himself around Knives and that they're made for each other, but I think it only demonstrates that he's an auto pilot with a girl five years younger than him so he doesn't have to grow or mature, and his dissonance with Ramona is a wake-up call to function as an adult. There is then the case to be made that they only exist for Scott's own growth, and I can't really disagree with that criticism. They certainly have more individual growth and change in the comics, but I think the movie just tried to do a little too much in the adaptation process. While it fumbles on these things though, I do think it's worth celebrating what the film accomplishes. This rewatch was interesting because I'm finally Scott's age. I don't know why they made him 22 in the movie instead of 23, but it's kind of funny because I've spent so much time talking about how it's about immature 20-somethings when I actually feel like everyone in the movie has settled more neatly into a young adult life than I have. I imagine part of this is because I only recently graduated college, and I believe these characters didn't go to college, so they literally have settled into their adult lives for longer, but maybe I'll be in their shoes soon enough. <laughs> I figured I'd cover all my blue-haired manic pixie dream girl bases here, couldn't leave this one out. I think this movie has a little more claim to its approach though. Scott Pilgrim is the perspective character of Scott Pilgrim, so Ramona not having the biggest arc is kind of part of his journey of demystifying her and whatnot, but that's not the most sound justification. Eternal Sunshine, on the other hand, is directly commenting on the one-sidedness of relationships, so the frequent, unsympathetic portrayals of Clementine cheating on Joel or binge drinking feel a little more thematically motivated. And narratively, too. We're supposed to follow the initial comfort and pain of Joel getting the worst memories of their relationship out of his head. Maybe that's a charitable reading, but from what I understand, Charlie Kaufman writes with that trope pretty actively in mind. I don't know if that's a later response to push back from stuff like Eternal Sunshine or what, but I could potentially see the innate bias in Joel's reflection on the relationship, which more implicitly colors him in as also problematic to a degree, 
as a comment on movies like Scott Pilgrim portraying their love interests the way they do. I'm always taken out a bit by Clem's initial dialogue with Joel on the train, which feels to me like movie dialogue. I'm a vindictive little bitch, truth be told. And maybe the only way I can make sense of it is if I interpret it as critical and deconstructive. A lot of this has to do with pure faith in the artist. Having seen Adaptation, I now assume every Kaufman film is in conversation with the meta, something I go a little more into in my video on I'm Thinking of Ending Things. Just had to plug that real quick. I am wary of charitable readings. I feel like I can't talk about a Kaufman film without throwing that term around at least a couple times. But if the material's there, it's there. The thing is, though, I hadn't seen Adaptation back in the day when I first watched this. Eternal Sunshine was the only Kaufman film I'd seen for like four or five years, so I obviously wasn't putting it in conversation with his other work, or even having the capacity to separate what his direct contributions or artistic interests were. So I got very caught up in just the straightforward pathos of the relationship and the other relationships in the movie. And I think what allowed the film to work on this level was actually Michel Gondry's direction. Since Kaufman started directing his own films, we've seen his more mechanical, abstract sensibilities take over. I do think something like Synecdoche, New York warrants a more uncanny approach like that, even on a screenplay level, and I eat that shit up. But it is nice watching some of his earlier films be helmed by more humanist directors and actually seem to take place in the real world with real people. The original screenplay actually had a much loftier conception of the memory facility, and a generally more macro approach that I'm sure was conceived as something more aligned with Synecdoche in the first place. But I think if the film were handled more similarly to the films he's directed himself and zoomed out of the intimate character work, the deconstruction would eclipse the pathos, and the film wouldn't resonate as much with 14-year-old budding film enthusiasts. I also think it would cause some of the moments setting up small details that pay off later to get bogged down with overt intention. Gondry's frenetic, jump-cutty approach disguises these moments as loose or improvisatory, as well as justifies the rollout of information. Scene order, obscuring characters for later reveals, lengthy digressions following the personal lives of the technicians, we buy into this scatterbrained approach as a decision in service of the fractured memory hole Joel's diving down for the procedure, which then makes it all the more satisfying to find out later how tightly structured the film actually is like a Trojan horse of structure. And in a broader sense, the surface-level deconstruction of relationships is a Trojan horse for the deconstruction of genre tropes. Or at least that's the order I've perceived it in. As with everything, though, I've become more critical of this movie with time, especially through that metal lens I inevitably view it through now. I do think the deconstruction shoots itself in the foot at times, for instance. The narrative setup allows for the same explicit commentary while we jump through scattered points in the relationship as something like Annie Hall, but without the postmodern sensibilities like breaking the fourth wall. Unfortunately, the highlights of the relationship often ring through as inauthentic due to Kaufman's abstraction. There's a scene where Joel picks up on Patrick plagiarizing his memorabilia, and calling Clem Tangerine, and he's like, How does he know to call you that? But I feel like Tangerine is one of the first nicknames you'd come up with for someone named Clementine. It's slow hanging fruit, if you'll permit me that one. Maybe Joel freaking out is a commentary on insecurity, specifically because it's such an intuitive nickname? Or the memory where they're in bed, and Joel's like, Please let me keep this memory. The memory is as generic as a John Wick esque flashback to protagonist's dead wife. There is something universal in these stock experiences. But as Kaufman would explicitly address in his other work, the universality in the specific just hits harder. The lobster scene in Annie Hall, for instance, is an experience unique to this movie and their relationship, but it demonstrates a core romantic experience. And I don't think Kaufman's abstraction or commentary necessitates that these things be as stock as they are. Nor do I think they contribute particularly more to the commentary than unique experiences, other than to suggest that we're all ants living the same life. Which isn't an unprecedented notion for Kaufman to tackle cool but I think he ultimately does have faith in the uniqueness of the individual human experience. I mean, even in this film, we have the crack in the ice, which has far more ripples and relationship implications and even sheer iconography. I just wish there was more stuff like that or the Montauk house. There's consequently an uncanny smallness to these characters' lives that I think is the abstract Kaufman bleeding through the humanist Gondry. That smallness is something that probably works when Kaufman does paint a more macro portrait like Synecdoche, or even the original draft of this film so I guess I'd just call this a spurt of artistic incongruence between the two. I also think, circling back to the start of this segment, that despite flipping the manic pixie dream girl trope on its head to implicitly indict Joel as well, 
that indictment isn't as severe as how problematic and selfish he makes Clementine out to be, thus falling into the same pitfalls it's actively attempting to subvert. I guess the difference between this and Scott Pilgrim, though, is that it doesn't reward Joel for his mistakes. It doesn't necessarily punish him either, but it achieves a situation that avoids that binary in the first place, which, in my opinion, makes this a more spiritually nourishing film. <laughs> If there's one thing I can be sure holds up, it's Atlas VPN, the sponsor of today's video. Atlas VPN encrypts your data and makes you anonymous online. Don't believe your data isn't secure without Atlas VPN? Well, lucky for you, Atlas VPN conveniently has its very own data breach monitor to prove to you how insecure your data really is. All you have to do is boom, 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 and then boom. Holy shit. But you're not watching this video to learn about your emails. You're watching as an aspiring scholar of world cinema. And how can you possibly achieve that status if you're limited to the geo restrictions of your country? Fortunately, with Atlas VPN, you don't have to be. Trying to boot up Netflix and get your tin tin on? I've been there. Well, tough luck if you're in the States. Hop on Atlas VPN, though, and you can take a digital trip to Spain and brush up on your Belgian cartoons. And it's more affordable than ever. If you click the link in the description, you can take advantage of Atlas VPN's current discount, which allows you a three-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's 82% off their normal deal. Do you know how much that is? It's 82%. But that deal won't be there forever, and the clock is ticking. So click the link in the description and see what Atlas VPN is all about. Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN. Do it. Atlas VPN. <laughs> so I watched this for the first time in 7th or 8th grade, and like many others, I think it really did desensitize me to a lot of fucked up shit I would watch later on. The thing is though, it's not actually a remarkably graphic film, per se. The rape scenes are, of course, very matter-of-fact, insofar as we see the victim stripped down, but we don't actually see the, uh, in-out, in-out, as it's described here. And by that, I don't mean literally seeing it, but we don't even stay in the scene long enough for that to happen, off-screen or otherwise. Except for the fantasy at the end, but I think that's a little different. The violence isn't particularly over the top either, but what makes these things more disturbing than the sum of their parts is the perspective, the frequent wide lens distortion that gives everything a phallic undertone. Like the image we're watching is itself as penetrating as the phallic mask Alex wears or the phallic statue he kills that woman with. It was actually Roger Ebert's assessment of that lens usage that first opened my eyes to the possibility abilities of storytelling and thematic development via lens choice alone. But back then, and even to this day, I very much disagree with his conclusion about it. Ebert claims that just about everything is framed with that lens distortion, but Alex is always either at the center and therefore undistorted point of a wide frame, or framed with no distortion whatsoever. The idea here is that the film is trying to build our endearment toward him, which so far I agree with. Where we differ is the intention behind this endearment. A Clockwork Orange is very clearly a straight-faced satire. When he says he's cured at the end, this is of course engaging with the themes of free will, but Alex is intentionally the most ironic subject to be a champion of free will. Outside of the text, he's obviously a monster bred by a fascist state. But by donning the mask and getting his perspective, as this lens usage allows, we see how the ideology being critiqued, played out to its most extreme conclusion, is more vile than a film where the characters realize that a bad thing is bad. That is, as I've come to understand it, how satire functions. Granted, this film is basically what laid the groundwork for my understanding of satire in the first place. But look at, and I hate to always come back to this example, Jojo Rabbit a film whose marketing couldn't stress more that this is a satire. They sort of had to do that because Taika Waititi plays Hitler, but that film presents what it's critiquing as bad in the text. It's a problem that the main character subscribes to those ideas, and learning the error of his ways is the resolution of the film. That's not satire, that's just a story. And that's not a problem, I just think the film is mislabeled. Back to A Clockwork Orange, though. What comes with the phallic imagery is a comedic sensibility that enforces the irony of the piece. There's just something wonky about the phallusness, like with the drooped-over popsicle, that's somehow more perverse than anything self-serious. And this translates to other aspects of the film juxtaposing goofiness with atrocities. Playing the quirky synth arrangement of Ode to Joy over Nazi B-roll, for instance, tongue-in-cheekly highlighting the relationship between media consumption and ideological 
theological indoctrination. This culminates into a frame I used to hate for its ugliness, but upon this rewatch, realized sort of embodies everything about the thematic approach of the film and Kubrick's framework in general. It would be a massive understatement to say that there are a lot of theories on the subliminal images in Kubrick's films. I feel silly even having to establish that, because the conspiratorial degree to which people dissect his work is one of the biggest aspects of his legacy. And most of it, I believe, is pure conspiracy. But I really do believe that when the old man lifts his head out of the spaghetti, the bolognese sauce is meant to give him a subliminal Hitler stash. I think this embodies not only that subliminal element of Kubrick's work, but the comedic juxtaposition the film uses to present its characters being groomed as Nazi youth, essentially. It's a very ugly, arguably very British sense of humor, but it serves as a microcosm for the irony the rest of the film uses. Now, for the record, I'm not saying Roger Ebert doesn't know how satire works. He just denies that the film is successfully doing this. My main problem is that he doesn't really offer a reason why. He just asserts that Kubrick likes Alex and wants us to like him. But to suggest that the intention is to root for Alex, or to push the notion that violent men should stay violent because free will is what makes us human, or even to say that because the system is fucked, Alex is absolved of his sins, is more or less a willful misreading of the film. Those last couple takeaways are more from the popular Letterboxd reviews than from Ebert himself, but I think I'm always going to disagree with him on this one. I feel like this has been more just an objective review than how my perspective has changed on it, but I honestly don't feel all that differently about it now. I mean, what I've been describing is how I feel about it. I guess I know a little more about restorative justice now, but my biggest takeaway here is still the irony that was originally so eye-opening even if I was initially drawn to the film because I thought it was a messed up thriller. It was also the first film I ever reviewed on Letterboxd, a review I've since taken down because it was so full of non-statements. So I think the biggest revelation here is that I can talk about the film more substantively than I used to be able to. As to why the movie resonates so much with an early teen audience, I think a big part of it is the shock value, the sense of, whoa, can they do that? And I may just be speaking to my own experience here, but I think this desensitization contributes to that laying the satirical groundwork for other films of similar reputation. Fight Club or American Psycho, which I won't be tackling in this video, as well as sort of demonstrating in the meta what's in the text about art consumption shaping thought, to varying degrees of sinisterness, as in, shaping the film bro movie mindset is a little less grotesque than spawning copycat crimes. But that's a whole other conversation. This is still in my eyes the platonic ideal of a satire, even if it is such a teenage co-opted movie, and I imagine I'll be taking from it forever. <laughs> I think a lesser acknowledged member of the Alex DeLarge, Tyler Durden, Patrick Bateman camp is Lester Burnham. I want to see a painting of him playing poker with Walter White and the Joker. I think the reason he's left out of these lists is because American Beauty toes a much more sympathetic line while simultaneously having less faux heroism to model after. Sticking it to the man and rebelling against corporations is a little more appealing for teenagers to aspire to than drooling over your high school daughter's friend. In fact, Lester's entire arc is a Nietzschean regression back into a child. Teenagers already smoke weed and flip burgers and pine after cheerleaders. How is his lifestyle revolutionary to them? I went a long time without watching this movie, since before Kevin Spacey was outed, and I was worried that that real-world knowledge would ruin the film upon rewatch. But obviously Lester's already portrayed as a creep, so it's not like knowing what we know now exactly contradicts the text. If anything, it makes the movie's dissection of Americana and advertised lives even more grotesque. That's not to say it's a good thing Kevin Spacey's a pedophile because it enhances a movie. It just doesn't flip the needle in any opposite directions. If I had to guess why this is such a popular movie for 14 year olds, one of the reasons I'd start with is how heavy handed the symbolism is. I think it's the same reason The Great Gatsby is such a staple 10th grade reading assignment. That's not a dig at either work, I like The Great Gatsby enough, or even at overt symbolism. But when you're first developing comprehension skills, these are the things that are going to call to you and demonstrate that movies have an underlying language going on. This is in many ways directly in line with the film's text, that alongside an advertised outer life, everything has an inner beauty, be it people or trash bags. When Ricky's showing Jane the bag video, he's showing us how to watch movies with our cinephile goggles on. When Lester talks about being overcome with how much beauty there is in the world, capstoning what was such a visceral experience the first time I watched it, it was hard not to feel overwhelmed by how much beauty cinema has to offer. Offer. This was all pretty mind-expanding stuff for 14-year-old me. I was aware of how memed the plastic bag thing was from Family Guy, but I totally bought into it the first time I watched the movie. I do think it's pretty corny now, and on one hand,
one hand, I'd call that a knowing attribute of Ricky as a pretentious weirdo, but this movie posits him as the messiah. He's the one with the third eye open and teaches everyone else how to be real. I guess his influence got a man killed, but I feel like that's hardly his fault. For this reason, it's probably Ricky who should be painted at the barbershop with Thomas Shelby and Michael Corleone. But even though it's not as eye-opening all these years later, and doesn't exactly contain new multitudes as an adult, I did kind of forget how solid it is as a slow burn experience with perverse voyeurism and a farcical quality that's probably the aspect I newly appreciated most on rewatch. Spacey's channeling some classical Hollywood vocal effects almost talking like a 1940s gangster at times, and the moment the climax of the film hinges on is a visual miscommunication ripped straight out of Austin Powers. I also think in the genre of exposing suburban Americana for its ugly truth, this one stands out because of how thoroughly its advertised life thesis rings true for everyone on multiple levels, drawing a direct connection between the cookie-cutter suburban houses and the cookie-cutter personas people put on. Twin Peaks and Far From Heaven come close, but something like Blue Velvet, which I still love, has different groups of people who themselves represent the good and the bad of Americana, but don't necessarily contain that contradiction within themselves. The only time this strict adherence to the dynamic comes back to bite the film is the reveal with Ricky's dad falling into a bit of a dated trope. You could argue that he represents the authority people put their personas on to abide by, as Ricky does with his dad even though he's an otherwise liberated character, which itself could carry out the mission statement of the film, but I think it would lose some of its thoroughness and wouldn't have the same fractal quality. Quality. So, it's a trade-off. The lives I want to know more about, though, are Jim and Jim. If we don't even see what's happening behind closed doors with them, there's got to be some fucked up shit going on. <laughs> Since I set up a bit of a through line without growing movies in the context of Tarantino, I figured it was only right to close out with him. For the longest time, I considered this my favorite of his, and while that's probably pending a few other rewatches now, I do think it's his most indulgent, and indulgence is pretty much what I sign up for with this guy. Maybe I just haven't outgrown it yet, but I don't know why I'd want to when it's such a great experience on so many registers. The playfulness and small stuff like title cards and juvenile visual jokes are met with reverent stillness and patient, crescendoing suspense. That statement is probably true of every film of his, but the Venn diagram of samurai and western and exploitation films with cartoon and comic influence is just incredibly tasteful for how much it feels like he's a kid in a candy store stuffing his pockets with everything he can find. This is echoed in Robert Richardson taking his mastery of overexposure to extremes I don't think we've seen since. The only Tarantino film more indulgent than Kill Bill Volume 1 is Kill Bill Volume 2, but I think Volume 1 is a more streamlined movie and balances its gonzo indulgence with a more refined pace. I always used to think Tarantino was up his own ass for calling these one movie, and while he certainly is, I did feel a much stronger sense that this was a first act rather than a standalone chapter this time around. Is the film fetishizing a bunch of things? Obviously. But I'd argue that a collection of fetishes is one of the purest forms of artistic expression, painting with your most innate desires. Tarantino isn't so much interested in the cultures he's fetishizing, but in the film genres they've fostered. And this is the ultimate expression of him as a person who happens to like movies and the specific movements he likes coming through in his work. I think this last point gives me a good segue into the through line I've gleaned from this list of films. Across the board, there are obviously more sociological factors pertaining to masculinity, for instance, that contribute to the popularity of these movies, but I honestly think the biggest thing is their educational appeal. They're all fun, engaging movies, of course, but they each demonstrate in a very clear and in-your-face way some idea about filmmaking or film theory that's productively eye-opening for many young people. Scott Pilgrim's every directorial decision in some way reflects the adaptation process from comic to film. And even if you haven't read the source material, the comic influence permeates through the film's graphics and production design and editing, revealing the capabilities of both mediums. Eternal Sunshine presents a deconstruction of relationships that secretly primes audiences for an awareness of genre tropes and other movies. A Clockwork Orange, on account of its edgy appeal, serves as a crash course in satire and makes direct statements about art consumption shaping thought that were also reflected to a degree in its own real world reception. And in my case, it taught me the value of wide lens distortion. American Beauty, as previously mentioned, literally demonstrates the experience of learning how to find deeper meaning within movies and vocalizes the feeling of being overcome with beauty after witnessing the inner lives of things, including movies. And then Kill Bill and every other Tarantino film is literally a scrapbook of other film movements, a crash course 
discourse on world cinema in a fun, digestible, violent package. It's like when Martin Luther translated the Bible into German vernacular. Now maybe I'm full of shit. This theory only came to me as I was writing the video, which I had no plan or through line for when I started. I'm sure there are myriad other reasons these movies have the reputation they have, but I'm willing to bet that most of the other similar film bro canon films also have their own educational qualities to them. You could argue that every movie has an educational quality to it, but there's a somewhat amorphous ratio of teenage accessibility to overtness of educational appeal that these movies gravitate relatively closely to. As for the behavior of the film bro archetype, I might hypothesize that the education from these movies instills a smugness or superiority complex, as well as a contentedness to not seek out further education beyond that realm of accessibility, that contributes to a public disdain for the movies that fostered that behavior. But I don't have the sociological chops or the data to see that one through, nor is that really the intention of this video. I am a little wary of generalizing my own experience into the hypothesized experiences of every other American teenager who discovered these movies at a formative time, but if I'm being honest, I didn't have a particularly unique upbringing, so I kind of assume that if I'm privy to something, it's pretty much old news. I'm sure there are tons of people out there with identical lives to mine. It's a small world, but it's not that small. I'm even paranoid that there's a video out there I'm repeating word for word here, beyond the fact that these are just popular movies. I get that with literally every video I make. But maybe I should listen to American Beauty and embrace that even though we all live in identical model suburban homes, aka have watched the same movies, we are each individuals. Except even in American Beauty, which tries desperately to dispel that notion, there are still ordinary people normies, NPCs, whatever you want to call them. But I suppose it's an academic no-no to generalize so baselessly, so if I must assert my individual experience as a single human in the name of academia, so be it. In my own experience revisiting these movies after championing them for so many years, I'm certainly happy I can better vocalize how I feel about them. I have more to praise and more to criticize about each of them, which is only natural, but my biggest revelations were all extra-textual things which I guess is the only place to go after reveling in the films at face value as many times as I have. I do think I'm past hoisting most of these up as my favorite movies, as the components that represent me as a person, but to say I've outgrown them would be a little remiss. I probably have outgrown all the things I was worried about outgrowing, but those things didn't tank my experience with any of the movies. They each have enough going for them to endure, which, you know, is probably why they have endured. But we've reached the end. You did it. Congrats. Movies. I like them. I talk about them on this here channel. If you want that, subscribe. If you want more of that, follow me on my socials in the description, which has a link to my Patreon, which has even more of that. And hey, don't forget to check out Atlas VPN. Link's also in the description. Now I'm gonna go work a shift at the IFC Center and then hop on a plane to Florida. So thanks for watching, and goodbye.